So this is the 8th episode of our Schwarzes Marken Analysis video. Without further ado, let's get started. With a coup d'etat in full motion, we catch a glimpse of the Palace de République, also known as the Palace of the Republic, and that was the seat of the East German Parliament back then. Now, originally on site there was the Berlin city castle, but Walter Ulbricht, the first big leader of East Germany, he had it blown up because it was a big bad symbol of oppression and all that stuff. So on site the Palace of the Republic was built. And later on with the second big leader of East Germany, uh, Erich Honecker, it's got an infamous nickname. It was Erich's Lampenladen to the common people. That means as much as Erich's Lamp Shop. This is simply because it had so much illumination that it really radiated at night. And the common people who really had to cut back on everyday luxuries, they of course used such a nickname to really kind of make fun of their government, but only in private of course, and when they were sure that no one was listening who would uh, report them or anything like that. But yeah, um, that's a bit of a legacy for this place. And between 2006 and 2008, uh, this palace has been uh, demolished. And on site, they are currently rebuilding the Berlin city castle, although with modern elements of architecture, which I am not too fond of. But let's not get into this topic at all. <laughs> Inside, we see the Volkskammer, that means as much as the People's Chamber, and this is where the Parliament was usually debating and all that. So, it is noteworthy that the interior design is mostly correct, except for one specific element that was removed in this version, because usually you'd have uh, three big counterfeits of the heads of Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels and Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Uh, as I described in an earlier episode, those were pretty much the gods of East Germany, if you want to view it like that. And it really fits into the whole thing with Schwarzes Marken so far that they try to avoid really using the images of those huge important uh, historical figures from real life and just either replace them for someone else, like they did with Erich Mielke and Erich Schmidt, or leave them out in total. During his speech, Erich Schmidt calls out to the true patriots. This is a bit of an iffy thing to do, because patriotism as a term wouldn't really be used in East Germany. People were supposed to have this loyalty to the end, not to their country, but to socialism as an ideology. Because what you need to understand is that there are always two dimensions uh, for patriotism. Usually patriotism is for the country that you have, not necessarily for the state. And the difference between country and state is that the state is just the current political construct of that country. For example, Germany has a history that spans several thousands of years, but the current German state as it is, has only been there since 1949. So that's the difference. And socialism was really about pushing back the feelings you have for that country and just fostering your loyalty to that current political system that they had. And in general, as I explained in early episodes, you weren't supposed to really have this pride as a German or as a Czech, as an Hungarian, as an anything. You were supposed to have this loyalty and this pride for the socialist world revolution, because the big goal at the end was to have a socialist world republic, where all the people are the same. We already alluded to this in the past, but Erich Schmidt over here is pretty much Schwarzes Marken's version of Erich Mielke, again trying to not really use images of such historical persons uh, in this show, which I have no problem with. Uh, I kind of understand it, that they try to avoid controversy or something like that. Um, but it is very telling that they used to replace the, that they used Schmidt to replace the last name, because as a Schmidt myself, I know that this is one of the most common surnames in Germany. And 
It is interesting to see him rise like that, because usually uh, Mielke was just a subordinate, basically, of Honecker and the other great leaders of East Germany. So, in this case, uh, he would actually coup d'etat himself into power. And this is a thing, of course, uh, it's purely fictional over here, but it is an interesting scenario to see the Stasi basically take over. <laughs> Schmidt then uses a very important metaphor, sword and shield. In real life, the Stasi understood itself as shield and sword of the Socialist Unity Party of East Germany. The shield aspect, of course, defending the party from possible enemies, but the sword aspect was also actively hunting down dissidents, even if they didn't actively go after the current political system. And that's a huge difference to a lot of Western democracies we know today, who will allow for opposition but only defend themselves if attacked. Basically, they just react and don't really act. So, why did this come into being? Well, the Stasi was originally founded uh, based on the Soviet Cheka, which used the very same kind of symbolism. Hence, sword and shield. Another very nice reference that most of you will have probably missed is that Erich says mothers should not be forced to suffer the deaths of their sons. This is a direct reference to the second stanza of the East German anthem, which at the very end reads let the light of peace shine, so that no mother ever again has to mourn her son. So this is a very subtle touch they put into this scene, and I really liked it. So we have Kiel, Wittstock, Rheinsberg, Oderneiße, and the Havel River. So the map I'm showing you right now will be also down in the links. Shortly after, the scene switches to Wittstock, which in real life was a Soviet training ground in East Germany and became a Bombodrom of German military after reunification. It is shut down nowadays. But fittingly, it is located in the western part of East Germany, hence why Franz Heim and his western theater training forces are stationed there. The mention of the Havel River is something I may have to explain. It is the river that flows through Berlin, but also through the majority of the East German states, except for Saxony and Thuringia. Now, this area has a lot of stories, legends, myths attached to it, and most of them really picture it as a very idyllic and peaceful site of nature. Uh, a very famous one I can remember is from uh, my school days. Uh, the story of Herr Ribbeck von Ribbeck of Ribbeck im Havelland. Uh, I will spare you any explanation regarding that. But um, I liked the friction that was created between these two narratives, that this peaceful area is now facing an approaching war with total annihilation. That was really a nice touch to me. <laughs> Uh, she shows her, oh, your favorite Himbeer Torte, which is uh, German for raspberry cake. And this is a bit a uh, German thing with, your also has coffee. And in German there is Kaffee und Kuchen, in English Kaffee and Cake. And it's uh, an equivalent to maybe the English afternoon tea. It was usually a thing in the afternoon to eat a piece of cake and drink coffee in as a kind of a coffee break in the afternoon. For example, around four o'clock, that's still common with my grandma. My grandma usually, uh, especially on weekends, comes in and gives me a cup of coffee and a piece of cake or other pastries. So this is really a common thing in Germany. And I try to avoid it, as you know, I'm a bit 
strong in the wrong uh, sections so <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of a curse but in like big cities here yeah, like in berlin where i live it's not that common anymore but uh, in general uh, especially on the countryside it's still a very common thing in germany but let me know if you guys have something similar in your country like a coffee and cake break or the afternoon tea in england that would be quite interesting